Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Maximizing Your Existing Toolset. I got 99 tools, but time ain't one. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is John Gorenflow, SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to John. Thank you, Carol. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, excited to talk about uh, uh, what we can do to maximize your tool sets and, and hopefully get a little bit more time into your your uh, daily schedule. Uh, unfortunately, it takes a little bit of work to get there. Right? Uh, well, it's, it's a good time to be in security, right? Because everybody is talking about security, right? And uh, probably in ways that we don't always uh, appreciate for those of us that have been in the industry for a while. Uh, I think we've officially lost the battle against the word cyber, um, but uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll just uh, embrace it and, and move on because it doesn't matter what you call it. But we're all in the business of trying to protect data and uh, you know, keep our, our uh, organization operating securely and, and moving in a positive direction, right? So with everybody talking about security, right, it's both good, right, because there's likely increased funding for your for your teams and, and your organization. Uh, there's executive attention, which is you know part of what's leading to the additional funding. It's constantly in the news cycle, which makes it, again, easier to get the funding and the attention that you need and support to, to move your objectives forward. Um, there's a lot of new products coming onto the market because everybody's got uh, attention on it. The, the job market's hot, so if you're not happy where you are, you know, somebody's hiring, I promise, right? There's a lot of opportunity out there. And venture capital uh, is investing like crazy into security right now, right? And uh, all that stuff leads to the, the bad side too, which means that we have increased funding, a lot of executive attention because they wanna know what's happening with the money that they just invested. Uh, lots of creative new products that maybe aren't all that immediately useful. And how do you know, right? Where do you, where do you fit all these? new products into your existing security stacks because uh, there tends to be quite a bit of overlap and uh, there's a lot of marketing gimmicks out there that kind of trick you into thinking one thing versus another and what tools do what. Um, the job market's hot, so people get trained up, they get good at something, and then they go find another job making even more money. And that uh, is as good as that is, that is for us as individuals, that's not good for our organization because um, it becomes a, a, a bit of a, an arms race in terms of salary and, and such to keep talent in-house, right? And then we've got the venture capital folks who seem to be just throwing money at everything that has the word cyber or security in the name, product, or description, right? And all that stuff kind of creates this horrible soup where you've got a lot of money, a lot of people potentially spending money, executives pushing us to, to move faster, do more, giving us money that we maybe don't have an immediate way to spend or expecting us to spend it on um, capital as opposed to uh, labor and, and projects that would uh, maybe be more beneficial to security, right? And so that's kind of where I want to focus today is a little bit on how we can figure out where to spend that money and how those purchases uh, should be made. And where do we need to increase our tool set? Where do we, where do we have some gaps? And, and how do we make sure that we're making all the right decisions there? So we'll, we'll start with kind of the uh, a few different ways I've seen the cyber purchasing process go for different organizations. Uh, we'll call this one the first one. The, uh, the manager goes to a conference, the, uh, meets a really nice vendor who takes the, the manager out for a fantastic meal. And uh, afterwards, the manager likes the vendor so much they decide to keep them around. But without a budget immediately available to, to pay for the product that the, the, for that vendor, they Kind of rob the money from the, the training budget and uh, purchase the products, slide it in, kind of gets half implemented because most tools and a lot of organizations kind of get, uh, they get up, they get the lights on, they get to be able to say, you know, on a slide somewhere, hey, we're done, we've, we've actually implemented it. And it's, it's 
just kind of technically accurate, but maybe not completely done, right? And, uh, and then the last step in this process is the engineers leave for better jobs because they didn't really get to implement the project in a way that they enjoyed. And uh, they're going to go somewhere where they can get the training because the budget didn't get robbed, right? And uh, this is challenging in a lot of ways for organizations because this is the way our, our entire industry is kind of set up. I mean, this is kind of what conferences do. We've, we have vendor areas and, and management goes, and if they don't have an effective structure in the organization before they go to decide what they're looking for, the problems they're trying to solve, and knowing how to focus their efforts and their energy and their dollars, right? They, they can get tripped up, especially by um, slick vendors that are really good at the, um, you know, convincing them that the, their, their product has the, the cure for all that ails them, right? And so, you know, coming out of that one, like, I, I really want to stress that uh, RFP does not mean request for pork chop, right? Just because vendors take you out for a nice meal doesn't mean you need to buy. And uh, I know that's laughable and, and obviously common sense, um, but, I, you know, I, I've talked to enough security professionals that they laugh and there's just enough truth to that joke that it, it hits home for a lot of people, right? Um, well, and that kind of takes us to the next purchasing process, right? We'll call this the other purchasing process. This is where the engineer goes to the conference, right? The engineer goes, here's everybody talking about the awesome new tools that they have and, and how awesome it is to have this tool, that tool, whatever it is, something or other NG. Now, well, now everything is AI, right? Instead of NG, or you know, NG is old. NG stands for last generation. Right, but the engineer then has a little bit of FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. And so they feel like all these other organizations are doing all these wicked cool things with security. They've got all these tools that are more advanced. Get to um, their, their careers being held back because they don't have the tools and, the, and stuff that they need to be effective security professionals. Right? So they go home, they convince their, their manager and, uh, and their team, right? We've got to get this tool. It's the best way to go. We've got to have it. They get it. The, it gets implemented and it doesn't really solve any of the real problems that the, the engineer's company had. Uh, what really was was just this desire to, to feel like they were on top of it and, and actually keeping up with the industry and what tools are available and, and what everybody else is using. And, uh, and that's, again, just as dangerous as, as the last slide. All right, and then we'll call this, this next one the, the other, other cyber purchasing process. Right. And this is where the auditor notes the compliance finding. And like step two here is my favorite because literally magic happens and money just appears. It's just like, poof, right? Like two weeks ago, there was no money for anything. Auditor mentions one little thing and all of a sudden there's, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars to go, go buy some new firewalls or go buy a new uh, security tool of some sort, right? The tool gets purchased uh, without really testing them sometimes, gets installed, the lights are blinking, and we get to say enough that the auditor goes away, right? The auditor closes the finding, and that's kind of the end of it, right? I've seen more than once where tools went in, and like then the, the time required to actually take the tool, tune it, figure out what to do with the alerts, make it uh, absolutely effective, doesn't happen because you know, it's, it's moved on. The, the, the real issue was the audit finding and not actually security, which is you know, kind of our problem right? Uh, we're, we're getting things mixed up. I'll, I'll come back to that in a few slides here. Well, you know, this creates all sorts of issues for us, and, and the cycle repeats, right? The bigger the company, the more vicious that cycle can be, and then the more influence that vendors can have on um, what that uh, what that purchasing process looks like, what tools that are going to be run in an organization, and it gets more difficult to, to make the decisions of what tools you're going to use, because then you have um, you know, the bigger you get, the more teams are involved, more opinions uh, and more preferences in terms of how things should be divvied up and organized and, and what should be prioritized. Right? And then it's also, it's really not uncommon to see security teams that are just bogged down. They'll get this tool, they'll get it, and it might be the tool that they need, but they never actually get the time to sit and to tween it, uh, tweak it and tune it and, and make it do exactly what they need it to do. And the problem that uh, arises there is there's no communication channels. They don't have a way to express that to management or leadership to make sure that they get the time 
uh, and, and dollars they need to, to tweak and tune those tools. And, and the tweaking and tuning is the most important part, right? So the tools end up you know, half implemented and uh, only partially utilized. And then like, the, the thing that makes me laugh is we're starting to see tools coming out to help manage your tools. And it's like, we're, it's like tool inception, and I don't even know what to do with it. Like, uh, I sat through a presentation of uh, a product a, a couple months ago, and it was, it was an, they called it AI, right? But it was AI for security alerts. And it, it was it literally, the product reminded me of Facebook and having the ability to click like on an alert and how it had correlated some alerts. And it, if you liked this one, it'll keep showing it to you. And if you thumbs down it, then it goes away, right? And they're not going to show it to you anymore. I'm like, this is not AI, folks, right? Now, hopefully, there's more going on the back end, but that was kind of the extent of the demo, right? And like, but I'm sure that there's lots of corporations that can go out and spend money on that kind of a tool, right? Right? And then you get the new tools in, and you know, new tools fire new alerts, right? And then all of a sudden, the the, the new alert shows up. And the SOC is like, now what, right? Because we've got all these tools. We have a ton of instrumentation out there, but we have to have the, the people in the process side aligned to what the tools are doing. If we don't have all this stuff working together, then we end up with a whole bunch of tools that are doing a lot of stuff, but we have no idea what or how it all actually works together or what it's actually achieving, right? And let's say, for a minute, but we'll pretend for a second that we have a really good uh, process in place for taking new tools in and we get all these uh, alerts tweaked. We know exactly what to do with the alerts when they fire, right? Well, that's great, but are they the right alerts? Are they tuned to the business, right? Because sometimes the alerts fire, you identify this new risk, right? And so then you, you go and you're like, Hey, my, my tool found right new risks for you. Yeah, we'll just put them over there with all the other ones, Grease Call. I've had those kinds of conversations and it, it gets frustrating. We're doing the best we can to help secure the business and help them move forward. But either we miss something or they don't understand what we're talking about. Right? And we have to figure out how to bridge that gap and make sure that they understand so that uh, the alerts that we generate aren't just a, a you know, or the, the risks that we identify aren't just this pile of things that the business is constantly like, just trying to shove out of the way so they can keep moving, right? And so the years pass and, and the tools stack up, right? I think everybody has worked somewhere where, you know, unless you're brand new to IT or security, there's always this tool that is just there. You can't get rid of it. There's this weird thing about it, you know, it has some sort of sticking power in the organization and it just, you can't supplant it. It just stays, right? And and the more those things, the, the longer time goes, the more those kind of stack up, and the environment becomes quote unquote complex, right? Because you know, when it's um, when you can't justify everything, when you can't explain why something is the way it is, I found that people kind of just default to this. Well, it's you know we, we just have a complex environment, right? And I I, I cringe when I hear that because. My next questions are usually geared towards figuring out how much do we really understand the environment that we're talking about, right? And the, and the you know the the fact is that the as as the tools go in, without the time and the money invested to actually you know, work and tweak those tools, you know, it's 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 wasted money, right? So I, I call it cyber bloat, right? I used to call it infosec bloat, but you know infosec is now cyber, so. Um, and it just keeps going, right? And, and this isn't like a, a, a cyber only thing. We see this on the business side as well. They go through this exact same process, right? And that's the, the weird thing. We, we like to think that we're, we're doing a little bit better than the business in, in some regards, but we, we have the same problems in terms of how we define what tools that we need and what software that we're gonna use and how we're gonna move uh, and, and operate as a security organization. And, the, and the, the businesses struggle with that as well. And so more and more gets added, and the more you add, the more complex it gets, right? In quotes, complex. And, and the harder it is to actually do security then, right? And on top of all that, there's compliance, right? And if you've ever kind of wondered where all these uh, standards
standards come from. And you know, LXKCD helped us out with that, right? Now he's referencing AC chargers and, and character encoding standards, instant messaging, et cetera here. But uh, basically 14 different standards and, and somebody has the audacity to say, hey, I think I can do it better. Clearly, the rest of these jokers didn't do it right. right? So I'm gonna create the universal standard that covers everyone's use case, which we all know is impossible. Although we've all had that moment of hubris where we think that we can come up with that kind of standard. We just think that we have that extra piece of intellect that everybody else was missing. And the resulting situation is we've got 15 competing standards. And that just gets, you know, it's a mess. It's hard, right? Like the bigger the organization gets, the more these compliance standards you have to hit and they all conflict, right? So you end up having to pick the most stringent of all of them. And it's just a hassle. Right, uh, constant audits. So it's like you, you finish one audit and you get another audit, and it's just like like a bowl of alphabet soup decides to come audit you every every other week, right? And it's it's, it's very difficult then to get away from meeting all those compliance requirements on a regular basis and focus on the real stuff because the real thing that we're looking for here is keeping bad guys off our systems, right? This is what I call the the uh, compliance paradox. Right. And I say that it's it's when why became what and what became why, right? Because the birth of compliance standards, it all has good intent, right? Everybody's like, okay, we've got to do cybersecurity well, and a lot of people don't know how to do it. So what we'll do is create this standard. We'll have a whole list of guidelines, right? And we'll push that out, and we'll create a compliance board, a comp compliance body that's going to help enforce all this stuff, and it's going to be great because people are going to do things and be secure. Well, here's the problem: as soon as you make it mandatory, and as soon as that compliance standard becomes a thing, and there's a body to enforce it, and they have some piece of leverage that actually makes you implement what they're trying to enforce, the why changes. Right, and that's what I mean by the why becomes the what, right? So the why was to secure things, right? But that becomes like the, the what, but the why then becomes meeting compliance. And we're doing the compliance as our why because compliance says we have to, right? How are we gonna do it? We're gonna go through, follow the guidelines to secure the data, even though some of them don't even apply to us, et cetera, right? And then, the what ends up being these bare minimum set of controls to meet compliance and secure stuff. And if you've taken any SANS class at all, you can probably think of a few times where it's you know, real simple tweaks to basic attacks and you know, the, an attacker can quickly bypass a compliance control or controls that are focused on meeting compliance. And, and that's really true for most types of controls, right? The attackers don't play by the rules. Um, the, uh, one of my favorite scenes in movies is in the Pirates of the Caribbean, where you know, Orlando Bloom is fighting Johnny Depp and in a fight, and, and, and Johnny Depp cheats. He like throws dirt or something in Orlando Bloom's eyes. And, and uh, Orlando Bloom, who has been trying to be a gentleman for years so he can win the heart of his fair lady, like is quite upset that this pirate just threw dirt in his eyes and he looks at him and he goes you cheated right and johnny depp looks back at him and says huh pirate right and attackers don't play by the rules that's the point point. and so compliance has this fantastic set of rules but it becomes this these handcuffs that almost prevent us from doing the real work it prevents us from um getting to the the tasks that have the most benefit to security right and and so then we're stuck trying to play by these rules that maybe don't even apply to us in a given situation. And the attackers have no rules at all. And that gets really challenging for us, right? Unfortunately though, compliance is this necessary evil, right? If it didn't exist, there would be a whole lot of companies that would do absolutely nothing, right? So you know, you've got to look at the benefit of it. It's like at least some companies actually pay for antivirus now because of it. But for now it's built into Windows, so maybe they don't even do that, right? Now the problem though is if, if the compliance standard didn't exist, there are some organizations that would actually do more, right? And, and the reason is if, if you were told that you had to um, run a mile, right? 
and there was a, a cutoff, but they wouldn't tell you what the time was, you would change how hard you run to run that mile. Let's say your life depended on it. Like, I think I could run a mile in five minutes if I absolutely had to, if my life depended on it. Might pass out before that, I don't know, but I could do it. But if you tell me I only have to be able to run it in 10 minutes, how long do you think I'm gonna to take to run it? I'm gonna run it in 10 minutes. Why well, stress myself, right? And so by creating those compliance standards, like there's those that would just push harder and maybe do a little bit more, right? But, but now that that bare minimum has been set, why would they? Okay. But because it exists, you know, it's all that some people will do. Right? They're, they're going to um, stick to the bare minimum. If it didn't exist, they would do more. Right? And the, like the first, the last bullet on the left and the, the first bullet on the right, it's, it's the same issue. Right? And then uh, some companies, like the positive side here, they're again opposite on the opposite corners here. There's some places that wouldn't have a security program without it. And so there is positive there, and we have to focus on that whenever possible. So the soul-sucking side of compliance, though, a lot of the activities we get stuck doing from time to time in security, you know, the, there's no real security benefit immediately, right? Sometimes it's, it's just the, the, the fact of tracking compliance and providing evidence that we're doing X, Y, or Z, right? And if you're in security long enough, you're going to have to do that at some point. You're going to end up supporting an audit of, of some kind uh, for some form of compliance, right? And meanwhile, while you're chasing down these audit findings or like taking screenshots to prove that you've got this, that, or the other, right? There's uh, this real security stuff that just sits idle, right? Whether it's analyzing events, whether it's tweaking and tuning rules, whether it's pushing out updates, whatever that is, that stuff doesn't get done because we're doing all this administrative work for for compliance. So I have a few tips here just to uh, like help you meet compliance and also keep your soul at the same time. Right? Tip one, don't fight it. Right? Compliance is like quicksand. The more you fight, the worse that situation gets. Like the, the more you fight, the, the, the faster you sink. Um, I worked with somebody at one point and um, he wasn't, he would complain about compliance all the time. And, and the thing that amazed me about it, he was fine. He'd resist everything. And the harder he resisted, the, the more everyone pressed him for all of the compliance work, right? And uh, at the end of the day, if he'd have put the same amount of energy into preparing for it, right, and looking ahead and, and trying to, to be a little bit proactive so they didn't have to deal with it, right, it, the, the easier life would have been, right, because it's not going away. The compliance is here to stay. Right? Um, next step, like make it easy for the auditor, right? Because the, your program is different. Every company's program is different. Everything is organized a different way. It does not matter if you're the same industry as, as another company of equivalent size with a, a very similar customer base. Everything is going to be different. And so as auditors come in, they have to assess everything and figure out how all that stuff fits together and what it means, what are, what are they gonna do? So what, what helps is create the map for the auditor. Take them exactly where they need to go, right? Now, to do that, you need to, own a, you need to know and understand those compliance requirements. And then you map those things to your policies, procedures, the tools, et cetera. And then beyond that, you document the evidence and, and the procedures necessary so that, and you do it so well that Entry-level employees can go execute those procedures to provide the evidence. Then you have your most skilled people working on the things that take the most skill and the things that matter for security. Right? Um, a common pattern that I see is organizations get bogged down with these compliance requests. And because it matters, because there's real money on the line if you don't meet compliance a lot of the times, right? and uh, all sorts of hassle, they'll put some of their best people on the compliance stuff instead of you know, making sure that's documented well enough that then they can let the, the least skilled people deal with the compliance stuff. Right? So, so try and take that uh, approach. Right? Next, remember that an auditor's job is to find problems. Don't take it personally. Right? I used to get so frustrated uh, when I worked in retail, dealing with the PCI audit, and every auditor came from a different background. Right? One of the worst things that ha can happen when you have 
uh, go through regular audits is if you've had the same auditor for a few years, you kind of get comfortable. And then you get a new auditor the next year, and they come from a totally different background with a totally different perspective. I, I grew up on the network side of the house. Like I took the Cisco Networking Academy when I was in high school. Right? It gave me a fantastic jump start on my career. It's awesome. But as a result, like the, the frameworks that I uh, use to kind of learn and understand technology from, an, you know, obviously very early on, everything's kind of been um, through the lens of networking. I, I like I break things down into layers as much as possible. Like the concept of the OSI model stuck with me. And even where the OSI model model doesn't apply, I break it into whatever layers and I can and break it into. And it's just been kind of a, a mental model that I've used. I have a friend, Marcus, that he sees code and he kind of came up on the code side of the house. And so everything for him comes down to code. And those are two very different perspectives. Right. And so when you have an auditor that comes in like that from those different perspectives, right, if, if I'm going to step in and be an auditor somewhere, I'm going to ask all sorts of questions about network stuff and system administration stuff, because that's what I know. Right. People like to stay where they're comfortable and what they know. If my friend Marcus were, were to go audit, he's going to ask all sorts of questions about the coding processes and, and what the how that uh, source codes managed and deploys are done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so when you change auditors and they come from different backgrounds like that, you're going to get totally different questions and they're going to find things that the other auditors didn't think of. Right? The more prepared you are, the easier that gets though. Right? Now, the problem there is that when the more prepared you are, the more picky the auditor can get because like I said, their job is to find problems. Right? I have never seen an audit where the auditor came in spent a month going through an organization and on the way out said, well, didn't find anything. Have a good one, guys. See you next year. It doesn't happen, right? They're going to find something. Even if it's nitpicky, they're going to find it. The important thing that we can do in, in preparation for this is what, what I, uh, in quotes here, frame the pitch, right? So if, if you're familiar with baseball, catchers will, uh, uh, they'll, they'll, catcher catches the ball from the pitcher, right? And what they'll do is they'll, they'll move the glove just a little bit after the, they catch the ball to kind of make it look like the ball, you know, hit somewhere that's a little bit closer to the strike zone, right? And it's, it's all called framing the pitch. It's, it's taking every advantage you can get to get the umpire to see it your way and kind of come down on the side of calling it a strike, right? Now, you can't go too far with that. If you're getting ridiculous with it, um, it's almost insulting to the umpire. Right? But what we can do with auditors is we lead them to the problems that we already know we have. We all have them. We all know that there's things that we're just not quite as good as we could be. And you just kind of mention those things, right? And you leave some breadcrumbs to where those problems are, right? And those things, preferably, you already have a plan to solve them, right? Or the things that you need a little bit of support with management or upper management to get approved to get funding, right? And so you kind of lay out that breadcrumb, let the auditor call it out, and all of a sudden you're gonna get the support that you need to, to go do it, right? Now, you don't lie to them, but you also don't have to tell them that you have the plan in place or ready, right? So they come in, you've led them to this problem that you already know you have, and if you're in a good spot from a preparation standpoint and from a compliance standpoint, and they're ready to find something, you kind of hint at a problem, let them find that, and your work is already done. The plan is ready. And then you wait the appropriate amount of time, give them the plan, say this is what we're gonna do, and if necessary, it's gonna help with the, the approval to get going, right? Now the next piece here. This is hard. Auditors make silly requests. They do, right? And I've never had one that didn't. So you got two options here. First one, embrace it. And as silly as it is, and as silly as the request might be, you may be able to put that request to use, right? You may be able to put a finding to use in supporting uh, you know, your security objectives and, and projects that you're trying to get moved forward, right? But to have that wish list of things that you wish you could get done, but you don't have the time or money to do it. Because like I mentioned before, when the auditor finds stuff, money magically appears. 
just if you can frame those pitches or if they've got those things and you can somehow tie it into one of those wish list items, do it. Because as long as it's focused on making the organization better and not necessarily focused on like getting you promoted, I don't see any harm in doing that, right? As long as what you're doing is actually trying to help the organization and not just further your own agenda, right? Now, the other option is fight it, okay? Um, this one, use it sparingly, but you can play dumb with an auditor, right? Turn it back on them, like, how am I supposed to do that, right? That's actually a negotiating tactic. And if people want to push things on you, you, you put it back on them. Like they try to create the problem for you and you make it theirs. And sometimes when you ask that type of a question, the silly request from an auditor kind of just disappears because when you ask them to solve the problem that they just created, they suddenly start thinking, oh man, that's hard. That's really not all that important. Maybe that's not that big. Well, don't worry about it, right? Doesn't always work, but it's worth a try. And then the last option here is delay. I've seen a lot of the silly requests just kind of disappear as deadlines approach. Because the auditor, right, they have other gigs. They're going to move on, and eventually time runs out, and it's just got to get done. And if it's not that big of an issue, if it's one of those silly findings or silly requests that isn't, uh, isn't really required by the audit standard, then those, those things tend to fall off uh, when those deadlines approach. All right. But now the tools, right? So... Some of the things that help um, that we purchase help us with security, right? But when we get the tools, then it creates all these other things we have to do to, to update and deploy and maintain the tools, which then can get in the way of security. Depending on how your organization is broken down, sometimes the same people that are supposed to be analyzing the alerts are also the same people maintaining and updating the tools. That's probably a separate webcast as to how that stuff should be structured, but you know, that stuff can get in the way. I've been that guy though. I worked in a small organization where I was the only guy doing security. I was the engineer, I was the analyst, I was the SOC, I was it, right? And so every minute I meant spent managing stuff meant time I wasn't digging into the alerts that all my tools were firing, right? Now, for some reason, we tend to lean towards uh, another tools being the solution for our problems with existing tools. I don't know why, it's, it's, it's human in, in nature, right? We, we do that all the time. I think we just like tools. Um, beyond that, like, I, you know, marketers make it really hard for us because they, they find all those ways to just press those emotional buttons for us and convince us that we need this new tool to, to actually do security well or to fix our problems. And we have to be, um, we have to be conscious of that and also understand what is my real problem? We're gonna to get to that in a few minutes here, right? But more tools, right? No problems. Because everything that comes with a tool is something you then have to manage in some way, or somebody does. And so every time you add a tool, there's licensing hassles. There's the, there's the procurement process, which is never fast. I've worked in small organizations, and that procurement process is never fast. It's never easy, right? If, if it is, Right, then maybe that's why you have too many tools in your environment. I don't know, but it's we we go get this stuff and it's it's going through the hassles of, of getting the money. Not not fun. Beyond that, then there's the general maintenance. And general maintenance is important. Don't get me wrong. But if I'm doing general maintenance, like patching and and stuff like that on my server, the patching has some effect on security, obviously, but it's not focused on detecting attacks. Right? That's very preventive in nature, and it's not necessarily focused on all the uh, defensive techniques we need to be taking. So, and then we've got documentation, change control, all these things are very, very time consuming, right? And the change control kind of applies to things like general maintenance and all that. And the documentation is probably one of the most important things that we can do, but at the same time, again, it is not analyzing the alerts and actually defending uh, against the bad guys, specifically, all right? So what I propose here is that we stop building tools and we start building capabilities, right? Remember that when you buy a tool, you're not trying to buy a tool to have the tool. What you're trying to do is buy the result that the tool is supposed to help produce. It sounds really stupid to get that simple or that, that like uh, what seems like uh, something's relatively obvious, but I, 
I have seen too many people begin arguing about what tools to get in comparison of this versus that. And it's like a Ford Chevy debate instead of can the car get me to work, right? And what we should be buying are tools that bolster our capabilities. Now, the, the term capability is, uh, uh, it's been a hot button issue for me in a few jobs where people were like, well, I have the capability to do X or Y. And I try to argue that, no, you, you don't. Not, not in terms of how I, I try to use the word capability. And that's really based on the, the capability maturity model. Um, definitely worth a Google. It's, it's like a weekend worth of reading if you dig into it. But the, the way I like to define the capability, at least how I put it in, in my terms, is it's a combined result of all your processes, procedures, and tools, right? Those are capabilities. And so a capability itself is the result that happens from all those things working in concert together, okay? Now, not all capabilities are created equal though, okay? Because the capability can be misused, it's important to understand how I'm using it, right? So here, like a bad example of a capability is to identify malicious software on host, right? Well, yeah, antivirus does that. Windows Defender does that. Piece of cake, no problem. Right? A better way to define a capability is to say, I want 24-7 uh, monitoring of, uh, for malicious software on 10,000 hosts with the ability to triage and define next actions for all infections within 15 minutes of notification. That's a capability. And that, that requires that I tie the technology to process and to people to actually execute the process. And there's probably more than one team involved and there's a flow of information, which means that there's a certain amount of speed that all of our systems have to be able to process this stuff and how the, the data goes through. We have real requirements at that point for technology, people, and process, right? Beyond that, capabilities also have maturity levels. So if you go look at the capability maturity model, this is it. If you've taken like project management, uh, like the PMP, uh, same model, right? So we have level one, which is the initial meaning, like I can do it once, right? I can do it and it's done. Now, can I scale it? No, well, maybe not, okay? Next is managed, you know, then defined, uh, four is uh, quantitatively managed, and five is optimizing. And that, that goal of getting to five where we're optimizing, we're doing the process of continuous improvement, right? And the process of continuous improvement moves us up, up these steps uh, continuously. But what we wanna do is define our capabilities in such a way that we can get uh, begin moving towards level five. If we don't have them defined at all yet, then we start at level one, right? Where we see where we can start. If we can define it and meet it at level two or level three, then it gets a little bit easier. We, we know where we are, right? And the first step of getting anywhere is knowing where you are and then setting a course from there, right? So, you know, at, at this point, right? Like you're probably thinking, Okay, so you've given us one example of a capability. Where do we get them? How do we do that? How do we go, go through and actually create these things so we can make use of it, right? Well, I'm gonna give a very quick uh, InfoSec MBA. Now, last time I used this slide, people thought I was talking about a Masters of Beer Appreciation. Um, I wish, but it's a webinar, so I can't buy y'all a drink. Um, now, we're gonna, like, this is as simple as I can make business. Right, that's, that's what this is. So every business, we start out with a business and it's there to, to go make money. And every business has some sort of a market that they serve, right? They are um, providing goods and services, whatever. They provide that to the market and then the market gives them money, right? That's it, that's how business works. It's as simple as I can make it. Now, the problem is that along the way here, if at any point something disrupts the goods and the services, what happens to the money? Well, it stops too, right? And so then if anything happens to the money, it also disrupts the dis supply of goods and services. Right? So we have to have these two things working in concert. And keeping in mind there, what we have to do is figure out how our business is making the money and what what, if anything, will actually create those disruptions to the money, right? Or disruptions to the, to the goods. How is that gonna happen? Right? And so uh, 
we start applying security to this stuff, and it's, it's kind of important to kind of keep our mindset on it, right? And understand why we are there, why we're doing what we do for the business, right? So a quick example I heard given, and it's, it's a fantastic way to think about it, is was why do cars have brakes, right? That seems like a silly question, right? Most people will, by instinct, say, well, it's so we can either stop or slow down, right? Because you know, quite obviously that's what uh, the brakes do. But we're not worried about what the brakes do. We need to think about why do we need to stop? Right? Well, we have the brakes so that we can go faster. Because the faster we go, the more important it is to have the brakes. Right? And that's kind of how we have to think about it from a security perspective and how we work with the business. We are the brakes. And they need to understand that we're not there to say no. We're not there to stop. We're there to allow them to move faster or move in certain directions in a secure manner. Right? So another way to think about it here. Okay, so we have the business purpose up the top. Right? Why are they there? What are they doing? There's always a purpose to the business. There's always a reason that they're doing what they're doing. There's a problem they're trying to solve in the market. And that creates requirements for their um, people, process, and technologies they use. Because this is how they do it. This is how they fulfill that purpose. That's how they serve the market. And the business objective, right? That's what the business wants to do. And so the business is doing the things that are going to support that overall purpose. Okay. Now, that exact same thing happens down to the bottom part of the, this slide where we see the business objectives. Like, why are they doing what they're doing? Well, it produces business requirements for us because this is the business objective. And so the business objective is to achieve X. Well, they're going to use and people process technology to get there. Our job in IT is to help them find the right technology to do that, okay? And then from there, it goes through and supports the business objective, which is uh, the sustainable system and, and continues to achieve that objective. And they want that to be just operationalized, so it's just constant, right? And so down in, when we, when we start looking at the, uh, the right technology here, so based on business, um, requirements, right? And so we have to figure out what puts those at risk. And that's what we're there to defend. That's what we're there to protect. There's a lot of things that can go wrong there, right? Because as we go through there and we figure out these are the areas where the business is going to be put at the most risk. These are the things that can disrupt the business's ability to provide value to the, to the market. That's where we have to defend the most. And so we have to think through what those things are. Sometimes that's as simple as things like ransomware and protecting against open shares on their network, right? Because if things are encrypted, it's kind of hard for people to use them unless they've got the key, right? Um, but other times it's, as, it's more advanced where we're looking at protecting you know, treasure troves of, of PII and information like that because as the business has to deal with a breach of any kind, that's a huge distraction to the executive leadership that they deal with the headaches of that. Right? Think about how much the uh, executives of Equifax were pressed after the breach about what they were doing, why they hadn't done more, this, that, the other. They spent, I, I don't even want to know how much time and energy on that. And all of that time and energy was not spent on doing what their purpose was, right? what they were actually there to serve the market for. And that's true in any business. Okay, So we're there to look at all those different ways that the business could be disrupted from their purpose. And we want to help them maintain it. All right? Now, this is where we get our requirements. This is where we define our capabilities. Right? We need to be able to do X, Y, or Z so that the business can continue to operate. Okay? Now, I'm going to let you in on a quick secret. Your vendors can get frustrated as well. Because, you know, I've not seen too many organizations that put together really good requirements for their security products or, or just products in general. Folks tend to um, lean one way or the other. It, it tends to be something that uh, um, they either have overly specific requirements that uh, are maybe too much detail, uh, too much in the weeds, or they have no idea what they're actually looking for. Right? They don't know what to do next. Right? They're like, oh, we think that we should get DLP, but uh, we have, uh, you know, what's out there? Well, what problem are you trying to solve? Right? And that's, that's the, uh, 
that's a, that's a real problem. I have a friend that is a, a sales representative and he gets very frustrated because he doesn't want to sell to people who don't know why they're buying or what they really want because it puts them in a bad spot. Vendors get a bad rap of you know just like trying to sell anything to anybody. And, and the truth is most of them don't want to do that. They actually care. They actually do want to help you. That's not to say that there aren't sleazeballs out there, but um, even the sleazeballs probably don't want to create a bad relationship or hurt their relationship with your organization, right? They want to sell you stuff that you can actually use and they don't want it to come back on them when it's not meeting your real problem, right? So when your salespeople are pressing you to try and understand what the real issue is, don't hide the information from them, right? Let them help you figure out what your requirements are if you're not familiar with doing it, right? Now, to continue developing your capabilities, I recommend uh, using smart capabilities. Right. And so GE kind of led the way with smart goals a long time ago. And, and I think it applies really well to capabilities because if you go through and you take the time to look at it and say, okay, I'm going to make this capability. I'm going to define it as specifically as I can, right? I'm going to make it something that can actually be measured. It's going to be something that I can actually attain, not, maybe not immediately, right? Maybe it's something you have to stretch or work towards to actually get there. But like, we're not going to ask you to invent wormholes, right? I mean, something silly like that. It needs to be relevant as well. It's got to be something that actually makes a difference in the security organization, and it helps the business either, you know, secures the business as they move towards their objective, or it uh, it helps um, the security organization you know, better improve how it supports the business in those ways. All right now, important note right at the bottom here. Um, oh, I'm sorry, time bound as well. You want to. It, you want it to be something that has some sort of time associated with it. Because in the, in the example I gave with like an antivirus scan, uh, like it's easy to say that we can detect malicious software. It's another thing completely to say that we can do it at scale with this many hosts and with this kind of response time, right? That gets really important. That gets really powerful because that kind of information, when you have those capabilities set and they explain why that type of response time is necessary to supporting the business and their business objectives, that's how you get the funding. That's how the business says, oh, okay, I see. These are the things that are more likely to happen. This is the money they need to make sure that they have the, the people, process, and technology to actually help us execute it. All right. All right. So now you've got some smart capabilities to find. Now what? All right. Well, this is where the work begins. Okay. We need to take inventory of all the tools and all of their features. You've got more out there than you, than you realize. And usually what I've found in most organizations is a lot of these tools are maybe 10 to 20% utilized. There's so much more that they can do, right? A new tool is rarely the answer. But every once in a while, you know, you, you do need to go buy one, and that's fine. The important thing is that you make sure you understand the what and why and how well things can or cannot meet your requirements for your capabilities, right? So you want to go through. And the other thing that you're going to find as you go through and do this is you have a lot of overlap. You'll be surprised how many things in your environment can all do the same thing. A lot, a lot of these things are kind of become almost commodity features that everybody kind of adds in, right? Like at some point along the way, like, um, like mobile device management has become almost like one of those commodity features. People just kind of add it into everything else because to do much of the security type thing on mobile devices, you can interact with the same API. So everybody just kind of in integrates some of that stuff together. And it doesn't mean that you don't need uh, an MDM solution, but it's understanding which tools have those capabilities built in. Right? Then we go through and we look at the, we need to measure the effectiveness of each and look through and say, okay, what, what's, What's the best? I've got all this overlap, right? How do I decide which, you know, which, what's doing the best work here, okay? And that requires some testing, a lot of work and documentation, right? Now, again, this is all stuff that takes time, but can you start taking this approach? The time, it, it's, it's kind of like investing in your 401k. It pays dividends in the long run. It builds. As you do these things, things get faster and easier, right? Because you start reducing and eliminating. And the last step here is define pace, right? Once we understand how effective each thing is, go through and define pace. Now, pace is something that I learned somewhere along the line in the Army. I don't, I don't remember 
if it was like actually in curriculum somewhere, if it was just a concept that we use all the time. Uh, I've, I'm not the first person to talk about in security. I think like uh, Carlos Perez has a, a blog post where he alluded to it uh, a couple of years ago. But basically what it means is primary, alternate, contingent, and emergency. So you try and find for everything you do from a people, process, and technology perspective, right? you figure out what's your primary, what's the alternate, what's the contingent, and emergency. Now, now I always joke that sometimes you can't really fill out pace, right? Sometimes you get down to emergency, and if you're like just talking about general communications, like emergency might mean smoke signals, okay? And obviously, you're not actually gonna send smoke signals, but it's the thought process of going through it. How can I do it, and what's my primary method, right? And then, what are the other ways that I can do this, right? So if primary method fails, or primary person fails, who's the alternate? What alternate tool do I have, right? What's the contingent and emergency? Being able to define that stuff and go through helps you kind of figure out, okay, how important are various tools to our security posture? Okay. So here, quickly, this is just kind of a, a generic mock-up here of a, a con capability requirement, right? And so you'll notice I highlighted tool five and tool eight here, right? And then requirement three. All right, so in requirement three, we've only got one tool that can even do anything. So it has to be the primary. It may not even do it all that well, but it's, that's it, right? But then as you look through this, we've got all these other tools and we've got a couple like, when you really evaluate it, right? Maybe tool one should be the primary for requirement one, but right now it's actually tool two, right? And so you realign that stuff. When you get this stuff set up and you set pace for, for all your different tools and your requirements, you can look through and say, you know what, like tool two, tool four, right? Tool six, uh, I guess, I'm sorry, not six, uh, tool eight, not even being used, right? If we, if we actually start applying these things in this way. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that these tools are today configured to support these from a primary perspective or from a contingent perspective or whatever. But if we kind of see what that is, that creates the roadmap for us. What does our project look like to get to this state? So this is how we're operating, right? Now, it takes a lot of work. I'm not saying this is easy, right? However, if we go through and we do this exact same process, we can also look through and say, you know what? We've got to look at getting some tools to actually help us meet requirement three. Or maybe there's just a module we can purchase for like a tool one that will actually add some ability, right? And it's important to have those failover methods. We don't want to be in a situation where um, one, one thing or one process or one person fails and all goes to pot, right? Um, another way I've heard this said, uh, I have a friend that was worked with the Air Force for a while and, and their term was uh, two is one and one is none, right? And, and it basically means you always need to have some sort of, of backup for, for anything that you're doing. And that's not news to us in, in IT, however, I don't think that we always think about it that way when we're applying um, controls, right? It's the concept of defense in depth, but this is how we do it at scale, right? This is how we make sure that all of that is mapped well and that we're keeping track of it. Okay? Now, taking this, like, it's really important to remember to start small, okay? It, too often, we, we tend to have these, like, grand ideas of what we're going to take uh, and, and put implement and, and how much we can do and how awesome it's going to be. Um, and we, we tend to have this, this revolutionary mindset where we want to go from zero to a hundred as fast as possible. Right. But in all reality, you never want to do that. Right. Security in, uh, in most cases should be an evolution and not a revolution. And that's, that's really important. It, that growth should happen at a, a uh, acceptable pace. There are not too many things that I can think of that when they grow really fast are stronger because of it. In fact, the slower a tree grows, the harder that wood is, right? If Think about like um, kids as humans, as, as we grow, right? Like if the person is, if the kid is growing too fast, that's when growing pains come in. Like things are stretching, you know, more than uh, what they're ready to, right? So those are kind of we have to look for those evolutionary steps and put it on layer by layer when we do things layer by layer it's stronger right um i had a CISO at one point was a phenomenal leader and he came in and those of us have been working at the organization for a while um this new he was a new CISO and we had this list of things that we wanted to get done things that we thought we needed to do from a, a security perspective um 
technology, process, uh, like all sorts of stuff, you name it, like, and, like doubling the size of the security team, just all these things that we thought we needed to do. And when he came in, like those of us that were like concerned about the way things were, were just kind of hammering it, saying, look, we, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this, and, and press it through. And what he told us was, change is like water, and organizations are like sponges. You can pour the whole pitcher of water onto that sponge, but at some point, it can't absorb anymore, right? It has to absorb it, and you have to give time for that to you know, dissipate. And then you can pour a little bit more onto it. But if you put too much on at once, it's just going to spill over the edges, and it uh, then defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do. Right? All right, and then you also let your you want to let your measurement match your current maturity level. Right? Um, think about how measurements progress. Right? If you go back and and you read some of the earliest history stuff, right? So you know, we're in in the West here, like from a, a, a Judeo-Christian perspective, like they measured the arc in cubits, right? Which was like the measure of the distance from like the wrist to the elbow or something like that. Like, well, everybody's cubit would be different. It's not all that precise, but was it good enough for, for what they did and, you know, how repeatable everything need to be or how you know, they had quite obviously hadn't had the industrial revolution yet. So the concept of interchangeable parts didn't exist. So the measurements didn't have to be perfect. They're just kind of general statements, right? And that's okay. Start there, right? And then progress. And we're now to the point where like, we're measuring things in, in microns and things like that. We get really, really tiny and small, and our measuring gets more precise, and we use more complex tools to do it. If you went back and handed Noah the tools for that or whatever, you know, somebody was trying to measure something in cubits, you know, thousands of years ago, they wouldn't know what to do with it. There's no purpose for a tool that could measure that precisely. So start with where you are. Match your measurement to the uh, current maturity level of the capability that you're developing. Right? And one uh, final note on measures, right? There's two types. There's lead measures and there's lag measures, okay? Um, the uh, lead measures are predictive measures, right? And those are the things that you can directly influence. So things that you can take and and uh, take action that immediately impact you know, the, the success or the, the, the value of, of how that's being measured. Lag measures right, are the results. Those are things that we can't directly influence. There's a, you know, it's usually a uh, culmination of, of everything that's been done to that point that finally produces those results. Right? So a quick example just to kind of solidify it. We can't directly lose weight. However, what we can impact uh, on a daily basis is you know whether or not we exercise, how many minutes we exercise, and what our caloric intake looks like. Right? If we do all those things well and we create a good measure there, it's going to have the impact on the weight loss or the lag measure. Right? And so if we focus on those carefully defined capabilities, right, it aligns security's efforts uh, with those of the business. It focuses the time and energy on, on the real risks because we're focusing on then the risks that are you know, placing the business at risk, right? There's a it's business focused risk, not just trying to you know, defeat APTs and all that good stuff, right? But it maximizes the effectiveness of your existing tools. Um, hopefully you can identify tools that maybe you just don't need anymore and you can redirect the funding and, uh, and reutilize some of that cash or, or maybe find ways to use tools that weren't being utilized at all and can now be uh, redeployed in a, in a more creative way, right? And also identify the, the needs for requirements for new security tools. And at this point, like when you hit that point where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I need this tool to accomplish X, it makes it real easy to demonstrate the value of that spending to the business. And with that, um, are there any questions on the kind of the concepts and stuff that I've covered today? Hi, John. Uh, that's Carol. No, I don't see any questions that have come in. All right. Well, great. thank oh. you so much for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sands.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. 
And just a couple comments. Some people say, yes, thank you, took many notes. Thanks very much. And one of the best presentations. Thanks, John. All right, have a good day, everyone.